Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Good morning, Radiant. I, I don't know if you've ever had uh, this kind of slightly strange experience when you find yourself basically saying, um, I'm a Christian, and as far as I can tell, uh, I love the Holy Spirit. I'm you know, filled with the Spirit and pursuing Him and you know, reading my Bible and doing spiritual things. And I've got some great Christian friends and family and a church around me that's really good. And I'm physically, basically fine. You know, not perfect, but okay, healthy. And my mind is, I think, pretty sharp. You know, maybe not the greatest, but it's certainly not the worst. Think about my life, spiritually, physically, mentally, socially, and I kind of feel a blessed person. I feel like, you know, I have been given a good hand. The Lord has been kind to me. And I, and I, and I can't say I haven't changed. That would be an overstatement. But here's the million-dollar nagging thought. I can't help but think, have I really changed as much as, if I'm honest, deep down, I would kind of have hoped to? It's not that I haven't changed at all. It's not that if you were to ask my friends or my family or my kids or my spouse, has this person changed since becoming a Christian? It's not that they would say, no, he's exactly the same. No, no, it's certainly in my life, it's this more subtle question that the degree to which I would have hoped to have changed, the degree to which I would have wanted to genuinely become like Jesus, not just in the public place, but more profoundly in the private realm, in the place where other people don't see, in the areas of normal domestic Monday to Saturday life. It's in that realm that I can't help but often find myself thinking, even though spiritually and physically and mentally and socially, I feel like I have got so many things, so many resources that should enable me to become the woman of God or the man of God that I I see in here. But I still, if I'm really honest, sometimes think, why is this progress so apparently (laughs) not non-existent, but small and incremental and sometimes just plain shallow? Is there any of you here who would at least in any way identify with that kind of story going through your mind? So common that we just sort of assume it's just inevitable. Well, over the next few weeks, I want to look at what I genuinely believe is, I wouldn't say it's a silver bullet, okay? I am wary of silver bullets. You have that phrase here? A thing that solves everything with one little neat thing. I'm not saying that. What I want to humbly offer out of some extremely painful, vulnerable years is a key. Just a key. But I honestly believe it's a key in Christian discipleship life that for one reason or another, many of us, for some strange reason, have never fully looked at and allowed Jesus to help us see as part of our growing to become like him. We've got a a book that uh, we're going to be particularly delving into. Now, if you know me at all, my greatest passion is exegetical, line by line, preaching of the Word. You cannot beat it. It is glorious. But occasionally, we do also 
approach the preaching of the Word thematically, when we feel God's really leaning us into that place. And as a book that I would really encourage you to buy, uh, it's called The Emotionally Healthy Church. It does have a flashy cover, but I've lost it. And uh, apart from the Bible, this book has changed my life way more than any other book ever written. I've read it nine times, and I'm going to be going into it again soon. And it's written by a guy called Pete Scazzaro. And if many of you, if you don't know Pete, you'd probably like Pete. He's a very impressive American man, thank you very much, who lives in New York and is a high achiever and has done many great things. So as we gallop on this road of emotional health, on this horse over the next few weeks, and we're going to be talking about things that some of you will go, you'll twitch at. I predict that. You'll go, limits? Limits? Saying no to things and admitting I have limits? I don't like the sound of that. We are spiritual beings and we can push through limits, Tom. I want to, right up front and central, say the guy who wrote this was a very high achieving man and actually I believe still is. But he had to come to the painful and yet glorious reality that part of being a human is that, here we go, we are spiritual, physical, mental, relational, but we are also emotional. Say that word with me. One, two, three. Emotional. Yeah, I'm sorry, men. We are going to talk emotions for the next few weeks. And uh, actually, I don't make any apologies for it. I don't. I think this is something that, for some reason, we have often overlooked. And a visual, you know I like my visual tools. I often try and have a visual tool. And we have a pie chart for you. Can I have a woo? Here we go. Kids, DB04. Oh, wait. There we go. Run. Get your child. The problem is your child. No, no. Um. <laughs> there are many ways that theologians have uh, presented a theology of man, theology of who we are as beings. And I wouldn't die on the hill of this one, but I think it's helpful. That's all I'd say. And Pete Scazzaro says that he says that when you look at the Bible, you can, I think, legitimately view all humans as having five components. That we are physical, that we are intellectual, mental, that we are mental, that we are spiritual, that we are social, and we are emotional. Spiritual, physical, emotional, intellectual, and social. As you can see, I know if you like an acronyms, I love an acronym. I love any way to make things sticky, even if they're cheesy. That's fine. It spells the word spies. Spies. S P. How do you spell it? S P E. Oh no, I've gone wrong. S P I. I'm so unimpressive, but that's okay, because I'm emotionally healthy. S P I E S. And we're going to be looking at the emotional component, the reality that you can be someone filled with the Holy Spirit, loving the Holy Spirit, quoting the Bible, fasting left, right, and center. You can be super gifted. You can be someone who is physically tippity-top. You can be someone with fantastic relational prowess. You can be someone whose brain is the size of Everest and can out-argue anyone. And yet, there can be this hard-to-put-your-finger-on or sometimes actually very blatant expression of lack of godliness, lack of love. Let me give you some examples that Pete Scazzaro uses, uh, mentions in his book, just to help you identify with the problem. You can be a dynamic, gifted speaker for God in public and be an unloving spouse and parent at home. You can function as a church board member or pastor and yet be unteachable insecure and defensive. You can memorize entire books of the New Testament and still be unaware, listen, unaware of your depression and your anger, even displacing it on other people. You can fast and pray half a, week, half a day a week for years as a spiritual discipline and yet constantly be critical of others justifying it as discernment. 
You can lead hundreds of people in a Christian ministry while driven by a deep personal need to compensate for a nagging sense of failure. You can pray for deliverance from the demonic realm when in reality you are simply avoiding conflict, repeating an unhealthy pattern of behavior traced back to the home in which you grew up. You can be outwardly cooperative at church or work or wherever, but unconsciously try to undercut or defeat your supervisor by coming habitually late, constantly forgetting meetings, withdrawing and becoming apathetic, or ignoring the real issue behind why you are hurt and angry. He says, do you resonate with any of these descriptions? The leader who never actually says, I was wrong. I'm sorry. The children church leader who constantly criticizes others. The high control small group leader who cannot tolerate different points of view. The 35-year-old husband busily serving in the church unaware of his wife's loneliness at home. The worship leader who interprets any suggestion as a personal attack and personal rejection. The Sunday school teacher struggling with feelings of bitterness and resentment towards the pastor, but unafraid to say anything. The exemplary servant who tirelessly volunteers in four different ministry, but rarely takes any personal time to take care of himself or herself. this This is key. Two intercessors who use prayer meetings to escape from the painful reality of their marriage. The people in your small group who are never transparent about their struggles or difficulties. Maybe none of you resonate with that. When I read that, I really do. And my story was that I'm, fo- I'm almost 42, well, 41 and a half now. And I uh, went snowboarding on Friday. First time in 15 years. I'm feeling 41. Let's just say that. No longer 21. But I still got the moves. And uh, <laughs> a little slower. I have to kind of roll onto my tummy to get up onto my snowboard now. <laughs> can't do the course, you know, where you just compress it. But, but anyway, I'm 41 is what I'm trying to say. And I, I, um, I, I, I was a, a high achieving guy. So I got a scholarship at age 11, um, which paid for all of my fees to go to a very prestigious boarding school, a boys boarding school, which had six day a week school. It was that intense. And when I was 18, you went seven days a week. Then I, and I got straight A's, which is like perfect grades at, at, throughout my teenage years. Then I went to university and got a high degree. Then I became a Christian. So I was an atheist, then I became a Christian, and I got into leadership. And uh, by God's grace, the church, I ended up leading the church at a young age. And then it, it doubled, and then it tripled, and it um, ended up, we planted nine churches over 10 years. We had a $7 million building project. Uh, we, I headed up, the, I'm boasting, as you can tell. Um, I, this is going to be helpful for some of you, because as I talk about falling apart, it's important that you know, you know, that I'm not like a wimp, basically. Uh, my work ethic is really high, even though my wife might deny it. It's actually really high. <laughs> and so by 35... I honestly felt like king of the world in many ways. In the movement we're part of, New Frontiers, 2,000 churches globally, Heartland is England. I felt very at the center of things. I led a very big college ministry that had thousands of students coming all year. uh, And it was very heady stuff. And it seemed like whatever I did was like, ah. And then it all suddenly, I remember in one email, this, this family left the church. And it was just like, like this machine gun of reasons, and they had been really close to me and Josie. And that began, like it was just like God in a heartbeat changed the season from fruitfulness to pruning. And everything, everything, the building fell through at the last minute. 
the, just everything happened that you could imagine that began an incredible season of pruning. And what happened over those next couple of years, as God basically, sovereignly, no matter how hard I tried, I, my, my, my sort of reference point was the spiritual and the physical and the intellectual and the social, which meant I would pray more. I would talk to friends more. I would read more leadership books about how to solve it. I would physically do things to try and help. And what was happening was, was that as God was sovereignly allowing me to taste my humanity, my inside started to fall apart. I developed something called irritable bowel syndrome. Disgusting term, I know. Basically, I won't go into the, the graphic details, but it means you have cr- crushing internal pain, which is so painful, uh, well, you, and, and just lots of physical things happen, which means you're bedridden, and it's either caused by diet or distress, i.e. stress. And I crawled into my sabbatical, and, um, and basically, over those two months, God showed me um, that my calling and my gifting and my charisma in a kind of human sense was opening all these doors. And yet, I had emotionally, I hadn't even realized it, emotionally, I was absolutely all over the place. There were three deep besetting sins in the emotional realm that I was totally unaware of. Number one, I felt chronically over-responsible. Like, not just, you know, I'm responsible. Like, I felt responsible, and it's a whole deep reason why, hugely overly responsible for every person I ever met, which meant I therefore had no capacity, really, to tend to my soul, to love God and God to love me, and to love my wife properly, and to love my kids. I just was out there, thinking I was being a godly servant and I was driven and it was my ego and it was my empire and therefore I, I was an addict, 100%. 100%. Total addict. Over responsibility. Number two, I was a total perfectionist. There wasn't just things that had to be solved, they had to be perfect. And I, I was incredibly hard on myself, incredibly hard on other people if it wasn't perfect. And then thirdly, I was chronically impatient. Bad mix. So I'm feeling hugely wrongly, in a godlike way, responsible for everyone, not in a good way at all. The problem has to be solved perfectly and it has to be done now. And this was what I was, had no clue and guys, the scary thing is, honestly, if you ask Jesse, I got up early every day. It was drilled into me from my dad, who's a very godly man. You follow Christ, the first thing is you give a chunk every single day. It's like Christianity 101. You get your butt out of bed, you get up early, and you get in the Scriptures for a big chunk. And so, I would be filled with the Spirit. I would be weeping through the Scriptures. I'm an emotional man. I'd be like, Jesus! And then I would run into my day totally oblivious to all that was going on. A hugely helpful image in this book is that of an iceberg. And an iceberg, I'm told, you only see 5 or 10%, the top. And actually, most of what's going on is underneath the surface. And it, you see, those dark motives, those like underwater currents that were driving me, were already, they were there for years. But it required this near burnout for me to actually see them. One of the phrases that Pete Scazzaro says that's so helpful is this, is that most of us will never do the hard work of really looking beneath the surface as to what's going on. Particularly in the age where we live, and most of us are ad- addicted to, to, to caffeine rather than the Holy Spirit. We are. We're addicted to external things that we can measure, even though the entire work of the kingdom so often is internal first. Internal first. And you're like, yeah, I got it. And then our whole lives are addicted to actually an external world. Totally. We're, 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 we're not even closet 
materialists. We're blatant materialists. Everything about the material realm is actually what we measure. And all the time, God's watching his people, watching Tom, going, it is clear to me as that sunset, when I look at your heart, Tom, it's, it's, it's not just killing you, it's really offensive to me. Because when you get to the end of your life, it, it, you're not building with gold, Tom. You're building with straw. So I found myself forced to see the problem. Forced to. And if you're in a place where you're feeling somewhat almost at the end of yourself, I praise God for that. He will get you one way or the other. At one point, if you keep resisting, if you keep digging your heels in, if, he, if you will not partner with the kind breaking of Jesus, if you won't partner, it will take longer and be more painful and be more dramatic. He will have his way with you. It's out of his kindness, it's out of his love. And though, so th- the problem then that we want to look at is the fact that most of us ignore our emotions. Many of us will think that we're in touch with them when we're not, is that emotions are not everything, but they are part of the deal. We, we don't deify them and say they're God, but we don't deny them and say they're unimportant. They are part of who we are. They're a big part of who we are. And actually, you know, I love what Skazero says. He says, they're a major prophet, not a minor one. Oh, that's helpful. I think it's helpful. There's checks and balances. I hear that. I'm with you. I'm from England, the land of cerebrality. I'm with you. Think clearly. I'm, 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 I'm with I love it. But the thing is, in fact, this is where we move on to the second point. The solution starts with Jesus. It really does. It starts with your view of God. I mean, take me on theologically. Try and argue that the God of the Bible is not an emotional God. I will take you on. You are wrong. You're just wrong. And it's not just Jesus, although, of course, it's explicit there. You read. Read the Bible in a year. I wonder how often we do it. You read it. The broad sweep of it is of a God who really, really emotionally cares. Emotions are divine. They will be here forever. We will be in an emotional world. Hallelujah. Don't be scared. Honestly, I mean, look at Jesus. I mean, so many examples. We've got a few up here. First of all, I mean, and this is really key. These are, sometimes we just switch off when you see these phrases, but they're huge. Luke 19, 41. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. What did he do over it? I think we've got this on the screen. He wept over it. It says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over. Think about that for a moment. Just imagine Jesus comes to Visalia and he looks around Visalia and then he gets into the fetal position and starts weeping with despair. He's like, when I, when I look at this city, this particular city, you know, I'm not just like polite. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't care if he offends the Jerusalem people. He was weeping. It wasn't as it should have been. He wasn't just some kind of like smiling, stoic leader who was like, I know it's bad, but it's going to be okay. He wept. What, would he weep over your marriage? Would he weep over how you view singleness? Would he weep over your view towards money? Would he weep over it? It's really possible, isn't it? It's really possible. Luke 10, 21, he was filled with joy. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. And the context here is what's just happened is the 72 have just been sent out. And honestly, all they've, I mean, it's, it's great. They've prayed for people. They've seen people healed. But it's kind of Christianity 101. Go and do what I've done. There's no like building of mega churches or, you know, really in sort of strategic ways. It's just they've gone out, they've prayed on people, they've preached the gospel, and it's been great. But you see, Jesus here isn't like some of your dads, who when you crushed it and you did really well, he just went. 
and, and left you waiting for the time, the next time when you were really, really, really perfect. Man, he was an enthusiast. Look at it, filled with joy. Woo! Yes! Go on, 72. Boom, back of the net. So proud of you. We didn't actually do that much, Jesus. I know. I'm so proud of you. Can you imagine Jesus emotional about when you don't blow it with your kids? You know, often you do. But on that moment, you didn't. And your husband didn't see. No one else saw. Do, do we actually allow that view of the rejoicing Jesus over your little triumph? Your little triumph. You know, no one else may ever get it. He is emotional. Mark 14. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. This, this is beautiful. This is Jesus in Gethsemane. And it's, 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 uh, I think it's in every single gospel, certainly most of them. And what's so fascinating is that when you read the descriptions of Gethsemane, you can't deny it that a major thing that the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate is, is the failure of the disciples. It's not hurried over. It's like the narrative is, and then they failed, and then they failed. And the sorrow that Jesus is feeling of course, is mainly because he's about to go to the cross. I'm not trying to say it's not. Of course it is. But my feeling is it's possible that alongside the feeling of that narrative in all of the Gospels makes me feel like, oh, this was important to God. They could have done well. They could have said, no, we're with you. Give me a Red Bull. Let's do it. Come on. But they, they didn't. And forever, that is written down. And think about Jesus, the leader. You see, some of you... Like, you can't admit when someone lets you down that it's a big deal. You're like, oh, I'm fine. I've got Jesus. And there's this sort of stoic thing. I see it in my life. When you get hurt by people, you can easily have a quasi-spirituality where you're just like Robo-Tom. And you're able to be like, I don't need people. And there's a fine line, I get it. We're not to be tossed to it so that we need them in an idolatrous way. But what we see here is that Jesus in his humanity with his buddies in his darkest hour really needed them. And he, and he wasn't less God for really needing them. You know, he's really needy in that sense. And we see it, in, we see it th throughout the scriptures. We see it with King David. I mean, this guy, he killed a bear with his hands. Any of you boys done that? No hands. He killed, apparently. Apparently, you know, I killed a bear. I wrestled a bear. Maybe even more. This guy's seriously macho. And then it says in Psalm 22, 14, it says, I am poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted away. Psalm 31, 10. My life is consumed by anguish. Code for, I'm very depressed. I am really depressed. How are you doing, Tom? Oh, yeah, I'm consumed with anguish today. Morning. Consumed with anguish. My years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction. I didn't really want that answer, Tom. I just wanted to say hi. David knew his emotions. But then look with me at Psalm 131. He says this here. Because of time, we're going through this quick. My heart is not proud, O oh Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Listen, here we go. This is the guy with all these huge emotions. But I have stilled and quietened my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Do you feel this amazing masculine animal killing man who is deeply in touch with his depression and his anxiety and his fears as well as his joy and yet he has learnt somehow like a weaned child. Now I've never 
give birth to a baby. I don't know too much about weaning versus non-weaning, but the basic idea is I think pre-weaning, they're very like frantic, very dependent. And as the child grows, it just becomes more and more in an appropriate way dependent. It's like there, but the franticness is gone. It's weaned. It's intimate. It's intimate. It's still close, but it's weaned. David goes through the explosions of his emotions, but he's also here as a weaned child. Our emotions are made in the image of Jesus. See, Jesus had helped David. He'd helped David to be real about his emotions. That's why Psalms is the most popular book of the Bible. Gives you permission to feel. Gives you a language to feel. But then we see near the end of Psalms is that David is not just ruled by his emotions. It's not just, I do what I feel. I'm not saying that. But he knows what he feels as part of who he is. Some of you are in marriages and on the surface of it, it looks okay. And yet actually at any depth, there is a lack of connecting because one or both of you has never seen this as part of who you are. Why not? Our Christian heritage is to blame often. Our Christian heritage is to blame. It's secretly Gnostic, which means we prize the spiritual, we despise anything else, particularly the physical. Emotions are seen as fickle things. Our Christian heritage takes a truth which is don't ultimately be ruled by your emotions and brutalizes it so that it's like your emotions are irrelevant. Some of you have grown up in that. Some of you, your only toolkit is a spiritual one. Pray more, fast more, learn the Bible more. Sometimes our Christian heritage is a hugely shaping thing. And what it does is it means that your view of God is just distorted. You don't see the t- kindness of Jesus. We don't see it. We don't feel it. You know, last year when we did that box thing, do you remember that? Who God is, what he's done, who we now are, and what we do. For so many of us, I mean, if not all of us, the goodness and the kindness of the Father is something that we kind of get 1% of, but we don't really believe that our Father and that Jesus genuinely are actually that kind and that merciful. For so many of us, when, when John Wesley, he had a, had a mental faith, he had an intellectual ascension, and then it famously says one day he was listening to a sermon, and he says his heart was strangely warmed. Heart was strangely warmed. That is emotional language. The guy who single-handedly was used by God to stop England sliding completely into moral decay and actually birthed a revival, the like of which England's probably never seen since, that man was strangely warmed. And that's the moment that all of historians go, his heart was strangely warmed. Hallelujah. His heart was strangely warmed. Didn't you see? His heart became alive. And then he wrote songs like this, Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high. Hide me, O my Savior, hide till the storm of life be past. Safe into the haven guide, O receive my soul at last. Do you know he had huge pressure on him to change that word lover? So uh, if you look at this on Google, you often find it Jesus refuge of my soul or Jesus savior of my soul, not Jesus lover. Is he your lover? Do we see him as that? Our view of God, of Jesus, often just filters the kindness of him out. It really does. Just, just, just check today. Is that, do you see God as Muslims see him, which is holy, which is not wrong? But do you also see him as loving and the God who put on human flesh? Because that's Christianity. That's Christianity. It's not just that he's holy. There are branches of Christianity which have incredible similarities to Islam. 
It's all about the holiness of God. And I fear the Lord. I really do. But if you do not understand the depth of the grace of God as the engine that changes your life, a holy God who does not ultimately give up on his people, you cannot taste the true gospel. It's also not just your view of God, it's your view of yourself. I mean, there's so much here. We, we touched upon this last year. Our identity. If you see yourself as just a sinner, scrabbling along in this Christian life, you're not going to believe that it's okay for you to talk about your emotions. You're going to be effectively like an orphan. Even though you've been adopted into the most loving family in the world, if your theology of your own identity as a Christian is not that you are a beloved child of God, then you will again and again think, this is, this is indulgent, Tom. My eyes should be on Jesus. Well, yeah, that's great, but guess what? His eyes are also on you. He's preparing you. He's preparing you. He's so kind. You don't deserve it. I don't think, it's ridiculous to call myself a holy one, but it's my, it's my deepest label. Way deeper than anything else. I am a holy child of God. That is the deal. You are in, if you know Christ, by grace, because of the sufficient work of Jesus. That is profound beyond measure. If you, if it's, I can therefore say part of my holiness is that I get to walk with my friend Jesus, who when you look at him, he wasn't in a hurry. He wasn't, come on, let's get to work. He was, as Dallas Willard said, a deeply relaxed man. Deeply relaxed. If you are always in a hurry, I prophesy there is grace for you. There is grace for you as you follow Jesus. You might be running like a headless chicken ahead of Jesus. He's like, what is he doing? What's this, what's this beloved moron doing? Are you a beloved moron who's just... I mean, man, I have been. I told you that. I've already got my dirty washing out for you. So join me in the club. That's where we're going over the next few weeks. And I want to finish with one cheesy, but hopefully memorable, helpful, sticky thing. We're going to look at four chapters out of the seven. There'll be plenty of stuff to work through, even in four, believe me. And uh, many people are familiar with this little green book. Many of you go, yeah, I've looked at that, I've dabbled. But many of us um, haven't really, the, the key with this is not so much just hearing it, it's really what you do with it. And you have to therefore be able to remember it. Okay, uh, call me uh, a stickler, but it has to be sticky. It has to be something that you can actually practically, when you leave here, vaguely remember. Now again, this is just my own weird little Tommy way of remembering things. I'm a visual learner, I like an acronyms, and if you spell out the seven principles that we're going to look at four at over the next little while, they spell, <laughs> they spell out, well, it's not even a word, but they spell out that, LBL REMS. Now, I know you think I'm weird. Look beneath the surface, step one. We'll look at that next week. Break the power of the past. As you see the stuff in your soul, so often it's to do with your upbringing and the, the first part of your life. Step three, which is, I think, the real heart of this, is then learning to live free from pride, free from defensiveness, living in brokenness and vulnerability and actually pointing to Jesus. It's beautiful. It tastes magnificent, believe me, even though it looks weird. And then, fourthly, we receive the gift of limits. That's huge. As you realize you're not God, a huge daily, hourly embracing is the limits that God puts around us. We're going to look at that. But then that's painful. That is not easy. It's not easy. Embracing the limits God is putting around us is very difficult, which is why that next one, E, embracing grief and loss. Not just the big loss, but the little losses that are happening all the time. The losses of this dream, this hope, the losses of my children being that age, no more needing me anymore. It's everywhere. It's painful. We gloss over it. But when we start to look at it, it actually becomes the soil through which actually we tend to become like Jesus. We then finally, number six, M, can start to think about others properly from pure heart. Make incarnation your model for loving well. And finally, S, we slow down and we live with integrity.
Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. And I